somebody in Florida uh, that uh, I hope they are okay. Um, I just a couple of little things. First of all, I mentioned to Mark that uh, I have a tendency to sound directive and bossy when I'm telling people to change a slide and that's not my personality, but it is the way that uh, I might sound. So I just want you to know I'm not really terribly bossy. Um, I want to invite people to share your ideas and comments. So Mark has the chat open. You can stop at any time. You can ask questions at any time and Mark will cue me that there's a question. Um, I'm gonna go fast. We have uh, an hour of which we're gonna do 20 minutes on universal design for learning and maybe 20 minutes on differentiated instruction using Tomlinson's model. And so that's a lot to unpack in an hour's time plus to give you time to have conversation and questions. So I want you to think about that. There will be slides that I'm not commenting on and I have put an orange triangle up in the top right corner of the slides. So once you receive a copy of the presentation, those will be the slides that I have not spoken about. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Let's go ahead and skip to slide seven. Is this the slide? That one right there. Okay. Okay. So this one has two graphics and because we're gonna start with universal design and I wanna start with addressing the one that's on the left. You've all seen this slide probably many times and it has its own description of each of the little pictures that are uh, descriptive of what we're discussing when we talk about equality versus equity. And what I want us to ask is that you look at this slide a little bit differently when it comes to designing for lessons. Uh, Manella Calhoun, does she have a question? Nope. Um, okay, good, okay. good deal. Sorry, dear. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, the, um, the screen talks about how clearly in the first picture, uh, not everybody was considered. In the second picture, they had to modify the way things were. So they had to give somebody two boxes, one person uh, a single box. But in the third picture, they designed the ball field such that anybody and everybody can see it at any time, right? And so that's great, but we're talking about instruction and we're talking about lesson plan design. And so you're gonna to need to think about this in another way that complements what this graphic does. In the first picture, when you're looking at a curriculum such as the Project Wild curriculum or Project Wet, right? That curriculum is designed for us. It is a resource for us to use. And so the people who were involved in the designing of that curriculum, they don't know your kids, they don't know your classroom, they don't know your state's standards. They are looking at creating positive, engaging, uh, important lessons, but they're doing it from kind of a, a point of isolation a little bit. Picture two represents what we do after a lesson is created. So we have Project Wild and we have this material that's been created for us, but now we have to figure out how this curricula is going to work for our students in our classroom. And I know that some of you are trainers for Project Wild, and I know that some of you have no education background other, not no, but I mean that you're not in the classroom with PK-12 kids. And I know that uh, everybody's a little bit different, but I'm just gonna kind of speak from the point of view of the teacher, because ultimately what we want this presentation to do is filter down to the kids, right? We want it to impact the kids. Okay, so in picture two, it's really about what we do after a lesson has been designed when we're using a purchased or a provided curriculum. And in picture three, that's what we do when we are designing our own curriculum and being able to think about uh, in our team meeting, what we want to engage our students in and how we're going to teach them. So the reality is when you talk about looking at UDL, Universal Design for Learning and Project WILE, we're really functioning in that second picture. We are going to be thinking about the curriculum after it has been developed in relationship to how we know our kids, what our kids need. 
So that's something that I want you to think about. All right, stay on the slide, don't change. Uh, we're gonna start with a story. The story is gonna sound like it's about me. It is not about me. I want you to think about the story being about you. So here's the story. In 1977, I'm a senior in college, I'm married and I'm pregnant. I am um, a psych major. My building for the entire three years was never wheelchair accessible. Oh, by the way, I use a wheelchair, sorry. That's a little piece of information you might need. So anyway, um, my site building was not wheelchair accessible at all. Three steps in, once you got in, first landing, go to the first floor, six steps, five steps down, and then to go to the second floor, a whole flight of stairs up. Okay, every day I'd go to class, every single day I would have to stop someone and say, hey, would you like to take me into the building? Because this was prior to ADA, this was prior to even the Rehab Act um, providing for different kinds of accommodations. And so every day I grab somebody to help me in the building. In my senior year, when I'm married and pregnant, my research methods class is on the second floor. January, I'm four months pregnant. By May, I'm eight months pregnant. And to start the class, we asked the graduate student if he could move the class to the first floor. And the graduate student said no. He said that that was inconvenient and that he couldn't do that. And so we didn't. And so for four months, my ex-husband carried me up the stairs, pulling my wheelchair up, 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 up an entire flight of stairs and bumping me back down all the way up to the point that I was eight months pregnant. So in that graduate student's no, I want you to think about when he said no. And I want you to think about why he might've said no. Well, he might've said no because he was okay with me risking my health and the health of my baby. Probably not. I want you to think that he probably said no because uh, he was okay with me not being able to complete a required course for my major. No, I don't think that's what he was thinking. I think that the most likely uh, explanation for his no is that it was simply outside the social norm. It was outside the norm of his expectations. There was no law, no awareness. Uh, he just didn't do it, not because he was cruel per se, but he just didn't do it. And so when you think about that story, the reason I bring it up is because that was universal design for architecture. And that's where universal design for learning comes from, is from the beginning with architecture. We wanted buildings and spaces to be accessible and inviting to people with differences. And then we've moved from that to universal design for learning. And then we've also moved from that to universal design for technology. And so we continue to apply the principles of universal design to different aspects of the human condition. And I just want you to hold that story in the back of your head. And at the end of the presentation, we'll come back to another story. Here's what universal design expects you to do. It expects you to consider the ramifications of the needs of the students. You are supposed to take the students' needs into consideration. Rather than just designing a lesson that you think is fun, yes, we want fun, rather than designing a lesson that meets the standards, okay, we meet standards, but we also need to make sure that we are thinking about the students. And this is not just about individuals' education program plans or IEP accommodations. This is not just about uh, 504 plans and accommodations or dyslexia. It includes all of that, but it is more than that because it really includes all of your students. And you have to consider the fact that you have students who will never be identified because they don't qualify or who have not yet been identified for needing special services in some way. And you just have the typical variation of human beings in a classroom and developmental issues, whatever, cultural background, experience, whatever. So UDL is really about all kids. All right, so it expects you to think about the kids. It expects you to think about what's gonna benefit the students. So not just, again, what is, comfortable to you or easy for you or is always done, but what is really going to benefit the student. And if a student 
is different in their learning than figuring out how you can make that instruction accessible to that student. And then the third thing UDL expects you to do is to think outside the typical. If that instructor had been able to think outside of the typical, he might have been able to see a way of making sure that I could safely access his classroom, but at the time he didn't. All right, so look at this slide and look at across. You'll see that UDL covers three primary brain functions or brain areas, right? It talks about engagement. How do you make sure that the kid is all in? Like, how are you gonna make sure that the kids are excited, ready to go, focused and motivated to learn, right? How are you gonna represent information? And that is like input. Like, how are you gonna make sure that the kids get the information? And so do they have access to the knowledge? Do they have access to the concepts? Do they have access to the experiences that you're providing? And then the third one is that action and experience. And that is, how do the kids get to show you what they know? How can I show you what I know? How can I show you what I understand? And how can I show you what I can do with that knowledge? All right. So I want you to go to the next slide, please, Mark. All right. This is a lesson that is in the Project Wild book. And you don't have to have a copy of the lesson. I'm gonna give you enough information right here. If you have the book, great, but you don't have to have it. And if you're really super familiar with it, that's awesome too, but let's just use what's on the slide. All right, in this particular lesson, there are these two objectives. So I want you to look at the objectives. They want them to be able to identify animal tracks and they want you to be able to explain what tracks and trails can reveal about wildlife. So those are the two primary objectives. Breaking it down even further, they have a part A part of the objective, which is just learning how to identify the tracks. And then part B is hey, we get to go outside and we get to look at uh, the tracks and making plaster castings of those tracks. And then there's also some extension, which is kind of groovy because that means that's differentiation, right? So we're thinking beyond what the, the base lesson is. And it's talking about looking at other types of evidence in wildlife. All right, let's look at methodology because design, universal design addresses methodology. It talks about the kids can work individually or in groups. It has a handout, which is included on the slide, which is the green handout that says animal locomotion and pad, traffic pattern, track patterns. It talks about sorting examples. So it provides you a handout with four different animals and their tracks. And then it talks about how you can supplement with uh, pictures, photos, illustrations, or actual uh, molds of different kinds of tracks. And they want the students to write or draw their observations in some kind of science journal. They talk about the students doing internet access and that we go out on field exploration. Okay, so when you think about this lesson, <coughs> I want you to tell me what you can surmise, and by the way, this is going to be so obvious, you're gonna to wanna to hit me in the head, but what do you surmise by looking at this information? Let's start with the objectives. What's something you can surmise? You can type it into the chat. I'm just gonna give you a sec. Mark, you're the one that can see it. I didn't turn it on. Okay, well, let's proceed while you're typing. The assumption is that all of the students, yes, thank you, Nancy. Yes, 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 Nancy. And we can even talk about that. But it assumes that somehow the animals are going, the, the students are going to be able to identify animal tracks. Nancy just put up the idea that this is assumes that all students are visual. Well, she's right. Look at the handouts, the handouts are all very visual. And the only way in which this particular lesson might approach somebody who's not is to provide plaster casts already or molds where they can feel the different tracks. And then maybe even if you had hide or skin to match to those tracks so they would know better which animals, yes. It doesn't talk about literacy levels, keep going. Yes, it doesn't talk about the kids being physically able to go out into the experience. It doesn't talk about how the kids are gonna manipulate 
the tools, you guys are awesome. There's a lot there that this lesson doesn't consider because it's the broad lesson, not the one where you know your kids. All right, let's dig a little bit deeper. At first blush though, by the way, if you go look at this lesson, this lesson does talk about providing video. It talks about having molds. It talks about having pictures. It talks about having audio of the animals. It talks about going out and seeing it for yourself, touching it. It talks about manipulating the molds and the plasters. So there's a lot of different modalities going on there, but we need to look a bit deeper. So that let's do that. When you talk about UDL, oh, sorry, could you go to number nine? The next slide. Okay. When you talk about UDL, we said that there were three different components in terms of thinking about how the brain is functioning. One was representation. That's not the first one we said a minute ago, but that's the one we're going to do right now. So when you think about that particular lesson and you think about the means of representation, how did the students get that information? Well, predominantly it was visual because they either watched a film, a movie, looked at video, I mean, looked at pictures, uh, looked at a handout, or they actually went outside and they looked at the tracks. There wasn't much opportunity other than touching a mold and making a mold for students to get that information. So we really have to think about how are we representing things like the locomotion uh, of certain animals and the different types of locomotion. How are we going to represent that in ways that isn't just visual and how students might have other access to that information? It also talks about representation, talks about languages and symbols. Well, in this particular lesson, it does provide images of the different types of locomotion and it does provide images of the gait or trails that the different animals make as they go along in the environment. But the language is really complex. If you look at that handout, it's very complex. And it's uh, pretty complex in terms of its layout of those particular handouts. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the two handouts in a minute uh, to, together. And then also what does representation, it talks about comprehension. So, what do we assume about the background of the students coming into this particular lesson? We assume that they understand the difference between pets and wildlife, that they understand that wildlife uh, includes birds and furry animals and snakes and other kinds of wildlife, that uh, it includes different types of environments. So we really have to think about what's the background of experience. What if you have a kiddo who is strictly city uh, living and hasn't gone to the zoo, has only had a pet, hasn't really gone much to the park, or hasn't seen that many animals or really explored nature in many ways, their background of experience is going to be different than someone else's. And so their background knowledge may be uh, not as developed. Now, it's not just, oh, yes, and yes, who does not know an immigrant who might not have the same animals here that they may have had at home. Or let's do this, somebody with a physical disability or a significant health concern, and they haven't gone out and been able to spend a lot of times in nature and in out of doors because we really haven't had that many accessible nature spaces until fairly recently. So you see how representation is gonna make a difference. Let's go to the next one. Means of expression. Well, okay, this is how the kids are gonna show you what they know, understand, and can do. And so in this particular lesson, one of the groovy things that it has is it has the kids actually moving as the animals. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. That means the kids are really physically showing you how they make those different uh, locomotions and, and the gates. The reality is not all kids can do that, right? And then also it talks about using tools and the plaster casts. Well, what if I am physically unable 
to get close enough to a track that's down on the ground? What if I'm unable to use the tools? They're not equipped for me and my particular disability or physical disability, if that's the case. And what if I can use uh, assistive technology as a means of expression, but the access for technology out in the field is not as reliable, you know, in terms of use. So what are we going to do between low tech and high tech where we might have to end up using a communication board rather than my fluent uh, communication device that's assistive technology on a computer. So we have to think about means of expression. Uh, when we talk about the fluency, the expressive skills and fluency, again, second language, second language learners who are doing English as a second language, that might be a challenge in your particular classroom because you don't have the their language skills and they don't have your language skills. So you may be challenged in that way. Um, and so problem solving, uh, being able to communicate, that's important. Let's go to executive functioning. Well, in executive functioning, it talks about the notion of goal setting, being able to plan and have strategy. In this particular lesson, the one thing that they emphasize is taking notes of observations, putting down your observations into the structure of a journal or a notepad or drawing. But that's really the only process that is used in being able to make a plan. When you get to the second part of the lesson where you're doing the mold making or the, the casting, the plaster casting, it's very, very descriptive. It's, it's a great task analysis for each step of making the plaster, but it doesn't give the student a way of managing all of those tasks. And it's quite, it can be quite overwhelming. So figuring out how the student can figure out what chunks of that task analysis they're going to do, or you working with the student to figure out maybe they're not gonna do all of those steps in the plaster casting, but they're gonna use some tools or they're gonna do some of those steps. So that whole notion of executive functioning is a really key component that you're going to have to spend some time on for this particular lesson, especially when it comes to part B and doing the plaster casting. Let's go to the next slide. All right, expression. Did I say expression on the other one? Uh, let's not go back. I think I did. Sorry. All right, expression. So recruiting interest. This one is really not, uh, sorry, let me go back guys. Hang on, what was the one? This, there's a typo here. Engagement, that should not say multiple means. Yeah, that should not say multiple means of, yes, the last one was expression. This one should say multiple means of engagement, okay? So make sure that I get that changed before I give it to you, Mark. Okay, um, okay. so how do you get interest? Well, we're going outdoors, yay. Even if it's on the playground, to look for tracks on the playground, we're going outdoors, that's exciting. Woohoo, well, it might be. But because it's out of routine, it might cause my behavior to change with some anxiety or not sure what to expect. And so some kids are going to be very excited about going outside, but other kids are going to be like, what? We're going outside, but we're supposed to do X, Y, and Z. What do you mean we're going outside? So engagement is tricky in both ways, right? Certainly it's interesting in the sense that it's talking about animals and it's talking about how they move and we get to do some hands-on science. The kids typically really love that. So the, the engagement seems to be there naturally, but let's look a little bit closer. Why are, do the, where do the students have choice? Well, they have choice in where they look and what they see and what they report and what they focus in on. Once they get to decide that they're going to maybe do a little bit more research on a particular animal, they have choice on the research that they're going to do. Um, but what if the animal, as somebody mentioned earlier, is an animal that's totally unfamiliar to them? What if having animal casts and, and, and tracks that are more familiar animals within the context of their 
their own um, habitat, their own in community, right? So that might be something to consider based on where you go. And then also, how do you make sure that kids' effort is sustained and that they remain persistent? One of the best ways to knock down engagement is to not give them an adequate means of representation or information and not give them an adequate means of expression. So if you don't do the, the two first components with your students in mind, the engagement is going to drop. And so what UDL says is let's really look at how the kids are gonna be engaged. Are there options for the different goals? Do they have some choice? Can they make a decision about which step to do first? Are there different challenges? Are some kids able to be at a more basic level and be challenged in that way where other kids who have lots of nature experience, who maybe go uh, out and observe nature, go bird watching, go hunting, whichever, uh, maybe they have more experience with that than kids who have not had that experience. So, you know, what can we do about adjusting the design so that kids have some control and some interest and are challenged to remain engaged? And then the last one is self-regulation. And that is, am I able to look at what I'm learning? Am I able to focus on my goals? Am I coping with this change and where I'm at? Uh, do I know how to engage in the natural environment as opposed to a four walled classroom? Am I able to engage in, am I paying attention? Am I on track? Am I doing what the teacher is expecting? And in this case, for some kids, especially because it's a unique situation, things like visual supports where you have pictures or uh, field trip stories where kids are told the story about what's going to happen ahead of time. Those kinds of tools might help, help with that self-regulation. Having checklists. Uh, one of the things I thought about looking at the part B where they are making the plaster cast, that's a lot of steps and it's a lot of language in the lesson plan. So creating a visual picture checklist would be helpful to all the students to make sure that they have done each of those steps in the order that they're supposed to be in. All right, let me take a minute. You respond however you wanna respond. I'd love to hear your comments. I'd love to have Mark share with me some things that are being uh, mentioned and I'm just gonna catch up with where I'm at. And regarding comments, um, I think we're all caught up there. Okay, great. Well, then I, I found where I'm at. <laughs> I have notes, but I'm trying not to look at them. Um, okay, one of the things that makes me laugh a little bit about this presentation, and I hope you will laugh with me. Have you noticed how I violated just about every one of these principles? So um, I haven't given you multiple means of um, reception or, or the information. I haven't given you multiple means of expression. I haven't given you multiple means of engagement. And so that tells you, some of you are going, wait, 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 she's too slow. Or, oh, would you hurry up and just go through the slides? I get it, I get it, I get it. And other people are like, I can't type fast enough. So no, I can't engage, you know, or wait a minute, I need time to think. So I've really violated all my principles uh, and not mine, but UDL principles. So sorry about that, but I hope you, you see the humor in that process. Okay, uh, let me see where I wanna go. And uh, while you do that, I'll say from Kiki, um, Kiki Corey, who's just soaking it in, um, it takes her a minute to change how she thinks about the delivery of activities. And me too, I'm soaking a lot in, so. Thank you. You're welcome. And Kiki, I will say it does. And one of the things that we're going to get to in a minute when I get to Carol Ann Tomlinson's DI model, differentiated instruction model, is there is a common discourse that you will hear in the teacher's lounge on social media and so forth. And that is that this is exhausting. 
that the notion of having to think about all of these options and how to consider representation, expression, and engagement, and oh my gosh. Well, one of the things that I want you to think about is let's go back to the architectural model because that's where universal design comes from. What happened or what happens when we design buildings that don't have a lot of thought? They are unsafe, they don't function well, uh, we have to go back in and we have to revise and revise, which is costly and time and money. Well, it's the same thing about teaching. If we don't think about these things up front, then the reality is our students are going to deteriorate during the lesson. Either they're going to not be engaged and their behavior is going, their undesired behavior is going to increase. They are going to miss some key components of content and concepts that we are so excited for them to know and that relate to some other lesson down the road, which just pushes the problem further down. And they're not going to use the materials in a safe way, whatever. You can think of so many ways in which that architecture design analogy plays out in, in instruction. And so I'm gonna suggest that if you put the effort in up front, like once you get a Project Wild lesson and you know that the kiddos that you're gonna be working with, or if you're a trainer and you know the teachers you're gonna be working with, making sure that they have an opportunity to really work with these ideas. And my suggestion for a really quality uh, workshop would be to have UDL and then say, okay, let's have a special ed collaborative teacher. I'm gonna use Texas terms because I'm in Texas. So if it's not the right term for your state, I'm sorry and translate it for me. But I, if we have inclusion classrooms where a special ed teacher goes into the classroom, she's a, or he's a collab teacher, they're both collab teachers. So having partners who are already collaborative attending a workshop where they actually get to redesign a lesson from Project Wild or lessons from Project Wild, giving them time to do that would be an amazing workshop. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna move on. I uh, don't know what time it is. Anybody wanna tell me my alarm has not gone off. I think I have a few more minutes. No, uh, yes, I don't. it's 35 minutes after the hour. Okay, well then I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to continue and just move on. Um, and then um, we'll see. Okay, let's just go on. Let's move to the next slide. Go to 13. I, I don't, okay, we're not gonna do that one, sorry. If it's got an orange triangle at the top, this is the one I want, sweet. All right, you're gonna look at this and you're gonna go, holy moly, that looks complicated. Well, we're going to focus in on just a few points. And if you're familiar with uh, Carol Ann Tomlinson's work, then this won't be too overwhelming. But even so, we're just going to focus in on three, three aspects of this particular model. First of all, you'll see how I've circled uh, assessment. Okay. So in Carol Ann Tomlinson's model, she says that we need to do pre-assessment before a unit. Many of your teachers are familiar with doing like the interest inventory at the beginning of the year or the tell me about you inventory at the beginning of the year. And of course, most districts do some kind of language assessment in kinder, maybe first grade, or any time a, a person who is a non-English speaker comes into uh, a school system. So we have all these different kinds of assessments that we do up at the beginning. And I asked students after students after students after students, when did you see your teacher using that interest inventory that she or he gave you at the beginning of the year? When your teacher asked you how you liked to learn, when did you see that play out in, an, in a lesson plan? 
And oftentimes, even though those assessments were done, they weren't utilized to the best of their ability, but also it's not what Carol Ann Tomlinson is talking about. What she says is that every kiddo comes to you with a different background of experience, with different types of instruction, because we know schools differ from school to school. We know teachers differ from teacher to teacher. We know that kids have different experiences. We know that an income plays a role. We know where kids play, where kids live plays a role. We know disability plays a role. So every kid comes to a body of knowledge differently. But we also know that kids have different strengths within that body of knowledge. So if I were to say to you, trying to think of an example, if I were to say to you, and this shows my own interests, uh, I want to know about how well you can sew. Some of you are going to go, oh, please, let me just exit the room now. Others are going to, oh, yay, I sew, I make like this. Okay, but what if I keep narrowing it down and I say, there's all kinds of sewing and we're going to talk about quilts. Some of you are going to say, okay, now I'm out. And some of you are going to say, oh, yay, I make clothes so I can connect what I make with clothes to, to making quilts. So I find a connection there, but all of us have different strengths. Some of you just have sewn with a needle when something was uh, ripped in the moment. And some of you just stuck a safety pin in it and walked out the door. That's great, whichever one you're doing, but everybody has a different level of experience and engagement and knowledge and teaching around this concept of sewing. And so if our unit was on sewing, then you would do a pre-assessment specific to the unit because if you're a person who knows how to do gaming, you're going to be a rock star in the gaming unit, but maybe not so much a rock star in the sewing unit. Me, I'll be a, I'll be a rock star in the sewing unit. I will not be a rock star in the gaming unit. And so depending upon the unit, we need to pre-assess. So does that mean that before every unit you're doing some kind of pre-assessment? Yep, it sure does, but they're not long, they're quick. You can do them as a group, you can do them as individuals, you can do it verbally, you can do it paper pencil, you can do it by computer. There's all kinds of ways to do those pre-assessments. At the end of the presentation, there is a slide that gives you some ideas for how to do that. Okie dokie. So she says, let's do pre-assessments. And now I have a sense of where my students are going to be. So this lesson that we've been talking about is the tracks. And our assumption is that they know, uh, they have some background of experience, they know what a living thing is, they know uh, the difference between a pet and wildlife, they know the difference between a human and other kinds of creatures. I mean, there's all kinds of things that they know. And so this assessment is going to look at these four things on the next row where the first red arrow is. And once you do the assessment, you're going to be able to influence the content. So once I do the assessment, I'm going to differentiate the content. That means what the students are actually doing and what the learning goals might be. And hold off on your thought, the notion of watered down. Don't go there. We're not going there. Uh, then the other one is process. How are the students going to take in the information? How are they going to get that information? Well, you could connect that with UDL around representation. So the two models have something similar. She also says you could, you could differentiate your product, how the kids show you what they know, understand, and can do. Oh, wait a minute. That connects to UDL's expression. And then affect or environment, that's the tone of the classroom, the kind of the rules about how you can be social, what your voice is, are you going to work as a team, are you going to work as individuals, can you make freedom of movement to go get the supplies you need, or do you need to request information and only use certain supplies. So those four things are what Tomlinson says you're going to differentiate, and all four of those things connect to the universal design for learning. So what do you make, how do you decide? How are you gonna decide that you're gonna make changes in content or process product or affect? How are you gonna decide? Well, that assessment, and you're gonna do three types of assessment, three. You're gonna look at readiness, that's background knowledge, how close 
What's the proximity of the student to a goal? And remember, she says readiness. She doesn't say the child below grade level. Nope, nope, we're not doing that. She doesn't say the child who is on grade level, which is okay, but you know, we, she doesn't use those words. She intentionally uses different words. She uses the growth mindset, the idea that this is where you are now, but this is not where you will end up, that everybody has growth potential. And some of us are going to make big leaps really quickly, and some of us are going to make smaller, slower leaps over time, but everybody makes leaps or growth. And so she says that readiness looks at, are you approaching the current, is your proximity to the goals approaching the lesson? Or are you way beyond the goals because of your background of experience and your prior learning and prior teaching and everything else? So readiness is a little bit different than what you traditionally think of. And then there's the standbys, which we have all integrated. Project Wild has great interest opportunities, great uh, modality changes within their lesson plans. And so interest in learning profiles uh, are really well addressed across uh, Project Wild curriculum. The challenge is it's not specific to your own students. And so that's going to make a difference. I want to say one more thing before we move this slide. Learning profile. Controversial. The notion of a learning preference. The notion of a learning profile. Uh, there are those people who are diehards around, you know, multiple intelligences, the VAKT, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, tactile approach. Um, there are others that say there's really not a preference or a preferred style or a learning style for an individual and that we really need to teach across the board. What Tomlinson is speaking to is opportunity, choice, having different ways of expressing oneself. And I bet if I were to ask you how you want to express yourself, some are you gonna say, just let me talk. Some are you gonna say, just let me listen. Some are you gonna say, just let me write. Some are gonna let me say, I have to doodle. I don't know how, how you are, but we all know that we do have those uh, things that we kind of gravitate toward. And Tomlinson's just saying, don't teach one, teach many. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is the same lesson. And I just want to say that in this case, the lesson does pretty well when it comes to um, having different modalities because you can write, you can draw, you can see, uh, you can be out in nature and hear. But it really, we've already talked about the fact that it needs tweaks. And so I want you to go to the next lesson, I mean, the next slide. Okay, this is Tomlinson's differentiation by interest. And interest is pretty uh, approachable. Uh, teachers use interest all the time. So in this particular case, students could choose the animal or the habitat or the ecosystem or the biome or whatever to do the research on their particular animals and tracks. And so I'm not gonna spend any more time on interest. This is one that we do quite a bit. There's lots of different choices. I've given you three. If you look at the beige um, box on the left and under essential questions, you'll see that it says stations, cubing, and contracts. Those are three strategies that are used to help students express their interest and have voice in what they learn. And so finding ways, uh, and you have to remember pre-assess. So when you talk about if you're going to be doing a lesson on tracks or a unit on tracking and tracks, then you would want to think about how you're going to pre-assess. All right, let's keep going. Go okay, to the next and, one. Um, uh, Sherry, um, just a time check for you. Uh, yes. Um, about 12 minutes left. And, uh, oh, okay. Also... Then let, me have, let me have two. Okay. A question. Uh, there's a question in the chat about um, the 5D framework and... Uh, is it comparable to universal learning design if you wanted to take that now or later? 
Yeah, let me take it later, but yes. Okay. In answer to your question, yes. All right, let's go to the next slide. So we're not gonna spend time on that one. All right, I wanna really focus in on readiness. And so I'll end with this lesson. I, I understand that I haven't gotten all the way through. And so that's kind of a bummer and I have to finish my story, right? So you'll understand why I told you the story about being uh, pregnant on the second floor in the site building. Um, I want you to look at this slide. What do you notice? Tell me, type in the chat, what level of readiness? I'm gonna give you three. Is it approaching? Is the proximity of the student approaching the goals? Is the proximity right at the goals? Or is the proximity beyond the goals? Now you can't answer yet, but I want you to look at this one and think about it. Mark, go to the next one. Okay, look at this one. Think back on the prior slide. What you should be noticing is that the box of definitions is less complex. And there's only one definition to come up with on the right. Go to the next slide, Mark. Ah, now this one's a little more complex, but we took away some cues. On, we, we, sit, we put back some cues on this one. So which one, how would you order these? Mark, can you go back to the first one? Oh, there you go. This one is beyond readiness. This one is the most complex. Go to the next one. This one is approaching readiness. The kiddos still need some work, some foundational work in order to get to the goals, their proximity to the goals. Can you go to the next one? This one is the at readiness. So this is an example of one teacher's, not mine, one teacher's approach to having kids respond to whatever study they've done on biomes. All right, I haven't finished this presentation and I am sorry, I have a lot that I could say. And what I will do is I will type up my notes and I'll give them to Mark uh, and I'll just finish with the story. I mentioned that I was substituting. So I've been substituting. I had a six weeks gig at the high school level. Uh, I've done uh, a lot of special ed at the elementary level. And the other day I was in a second grade classroom as the collaborative teacher. I was the SPED teacher and then I was working with a gen ed teacher. And of course I'm a surprise. I come in in a wheelchair and teachers and students are all like, whoa, what's that? because they don't see, in, at least in all the schools, many, many schools I go to, they don't see a person in a wheelchair who's a teacher. And so they always ask questions. Why are you in that thing? And I always ask the teachers, please let me explain why I'm in my chair. And so I do. So we're lining up and this little boy says, I have an idea. And I was like, okay. He said, I think that you should create or that we could create robots and we could put ro your legs in robots and then you could walk. And I was like, dude, you are awesome because they do that. That exists. And what a great thing. You are such a clever boy. You are so clever that you thought about that. That's wonderful. He said, yeah, I'm kind of really good at that. I'm good at thinking like that, thinking about things. He said, yeah. He said, I want to be a dreamer upper when I grow up. So in closing my presentation, the four questions, here's what I want. I want you to be my student who's the dreamer upper rather than my graduate student who could only say no and not think outside the box. That's it. All right. I love that story. Thank you, Sherry. You're welcome. Um, well, um, there may be more questions, um, but I'm going to um, take one that was sent. Uh, it came directly to me, so um, others won't be able to read it, but I'll go ahead and read it. And the question is, is the universal design for learning a framework comparable to the 5D framework? They're both used to design instructions based on how people learn. So I'm, I want this person, 
can you tell me, who, well, you don't even have to identify. Uh, talk to me about the 5D. Tell me more about the 5D. Yeah, uh, the so, um, oh, yeah, it's yeah, great. Yeah. I don't mind if she speaks, yeah. Amy. <laughs> um, I'm not, I guess, um, super prepared to like summarize this well, but the 5D framework is um, used for teachers to self-assess their progress toward uh, different criterion um, within their teaching um, based on how oh, people learn best. So there's got like you. gradation of um, observables, and then you can move toward a five on each criterion. Oh my gosh. If this is, it sounds similar. It is. I do agree with you, Amy. I think it sounds similar. And what a striking idea, yes, about the notion of how teachers self-assess that is an awesome idea. And it also speaks to the notion of UDL in the sense that you get to set your teaching goals. You get to choose what you want your administrator to observe and what evidence you wanna present. And that is fabulous. That's a great idea. Uh, and yes, in my opinion, it is strongly connected. Okay. okay, and thank, uh, you. thank you, Molly, for posting the UDL guidelines. Yes. And there are lots of resources. At the end of this presentation, I have provided you with uh, images of books that I have used in the past, links to CAST, which is around UDL, and then also uh, a handout um, that is from a, a teacher network that is a great graphic for summarizing uh, DI in particular. And we'd be happy to um, post this, Sherry, on our resources page uh, for at projectwild.org. Um, when, when anyone goes to projectwild.org, there's a link for resources and there's two major divisions. One is for resources for each activity within all of the Project Wild curricula, but then there's another way to go where you get resources that are programmatic resources that apply across the board. And that's where we can um, put up your, your presentation as well as recording to this webinar. Okay. One of the things that you wanna do is they, Mark has another presentation from last May and in it, it talks about issues around physical disability. And because a lot of the lessons are about going out into nature, um, one of the things you have to think about is medicine, food, technology. Uh, there's all kinds of things that when you're taking someone out into the, you know, into the community or outside of the classroom, besides just the, the trail or the path itself, there are other things that you have to think about. And so that's in that prior slide in the May 2022 one of the things that's exciting, I don't know if you've ever seen this organization. I'm not promoting an organization. I have no promotion, but Wheel the World is a way to travel with a physical disability. The parks, and you know this, Mark, you have a list of accessible parks, national parks and, and so forth. So there's wonderful lists. So when you get ready to choose to take your students out, choose the parks that have paid attention. Okay. All right. Well, um, we still do have a few minutes. If there are any more questions, now's your chance. And Sherry, uh, we sure do appreciate your, your efforts here. And um, some of you may have uh, attended other webinars that Sherry has participated in, uh, like the one last May, for example. I think that was with um, in combination with Project Wild, Project Wild and PLT. And for those of, those of you who happen to be Project Wild facilitators in Texas, um, you may have had the chance to meet Sherry in person at the, uh, one of the facilitator retreats that Kiki had organized. And thanks yes. Elena. Elena put up the, mm -hmm. our link to uh, the Project Wild website. You can get there at projectwild.org, or you can see the longer URL is actually the fishwildlife.org connection. Okay, well, 
I think then that concludes this webinar. Thanks everyone for attending. I'll be on for a few more minutes if anyone has any questions or wants to chat. And Sherry, thank you very much. You're welcome, Molly. I have to tell you, Mark, this is my swan song. Is that right? Yeah. This will be the last uh, professional activity I do. Oh.